welcome to a new episode of our podcast, Europeans, Stories from a Union of Volunteers. I'm José from Portugal, currently living in Sweden. I did my volunteering in Italy. Today, I'm here with Ilse. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Latvian. I did my volunteering in Sofia in Bulgaria for one year. And uh, now I'm back in my home country for already one year. Well, I'm not back in my home country, but I'm also back for one year already. And on today's episode, we'll talk about... Hitchhiking. Yeah, traveling during our volunteering and especially talking about our hitchhiking experiences. So I would actually first like to mention to our uh, listeners that if you ever uh, decide to do any ESC project, then you should know that you have vacation days that you are able to spend besides not working on the weekends and also the national holidays that you might have and you arrange with your association to um, have your own holidays. So basically, I would ask you, like, how was your volunteering? Was it only just work or did you manage to accumulate all these cool vacation days and do some cool trips? Well, um, I did accumulate uh, my free days because uh, I actually started traveling in the second half of my volunteering. Actually, that's why I was able to do some big trips because I collected a lot of days, a lot of free days. And what, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think one really important thing, topic that you mentioned is that you, you were able to collect the days and save holidays. Uh, but one thing that we should also add is saving money for our travels, because people might think that as volunteers, we don't have so much money. And to a certain extent, that's true. But if you manage yourself and you if you manage, manage your month, monthly allowance and you prioritize things that you want to spend your money in, then you have more than enough money to travel because you receive pocket money from every day for the volunteering and then you have also food money. You are able to do more than just live and work in the city that you're staying. But did you travel from uh, only your pocket money from EVS? So the answer is yes and no. Okay. So mostly yes, but my mother gave me a little help during the volunteering, but it's not that if I didn't receive uh, her money that I wouldn't be able to travel. Maybe I wouldn't have been able to travel as much, but the proportion of the money that she gave me compared to what I was earning during the volunteering wasn't that uh, big to make it as a huge difference. And you mentioned that you, with all these days accumulated, you, um, you were able to do some big trips. Where did you end up going? Wow, where I didn't go, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in Balkans. Yeah. I would say that I had two big trips. The first one was um, Sofia, Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo. And then back through Macedonia, I was with my friend. We were traveling for six days in a row, I think. And uh, we were only hitchhiking. It was a lot of rush because uh, he had to get back to his volunteering project. It was a crazy trip. <laughs> and the second big trip was for, I think, 13 days. I was traveling alone. Uh, I was hitchhiking for three days. And uh, the rest of the time I was... Um, traveling by bus. Uh, it was uh, from Sofia to Serbia and from Serbia to Montenegro. And I traveled uh, through the whole Montenegro country. And back I was going through Kosovo and Macedonia and back to Sofia. So we explored a lot of the Balkans as well. I mean, yeah, of course you would because you, you were there. But uh, I also did. And that was one of the main uh, objectives that I had when I went volunteering. And one of my main goals was to go to the Balkans. Like just go from Italy to the Balkans and then like enter back in Italy by boat and visit the south as well. And that was a really, really cool experience. So I was also in... Well, in Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Montenegro, and Albania. But I believe that you saw even um, like the, the the countries that you were visiting are considered as even more beautiful and uh, 
some people think that uh, they are the real Balkans, but I would say that these countries that I were in are the real Balkans because the real Balkans are so raw, you know? Yeah, and I mean, the the places I visited was more like touristic places. And that was like one of my biggest trips. It was like 10 days. And then I also did a, like a, a week trip in Sicily. I managed to connect national holidays to my vacation days so that I could extend my vacation period. Yes, that's that's what I did as well. But during the, this traveling, how was it feeling like the money uh, going out? Okay, you have it hiked, I have also it hiked, but what other things did you do to avoid spending so much money while traveling? Mm, I would say that uh, the biggest is using couch surfing, which is uh, a big thing for uh, volunteers. Mm -hmm. And also just basic, uh, usual, everyday hitchhikers using couch surfing. But uh, on my second trip, my profile was not verified anymore, which means that I could send like one or two messages per day, which is, of course, not enough if you are desperately looking for a place where to stay. So I was staying in uh, uh, the cheapest hostels. Yes. And also I have this story that I just stayed in uh, a place of a friend that I made on my way and uh, I didn't have to pay for anything. I didn't have uh, like uh, extras as Wi-Fi or uh, my own room, but it was uh, super nice. Yeah, it was free and it was super nice. Yeah, and you have like a bigger or a more authentic experience as well. Exactly, and with the local. Yeah, to add to that, I managed to save most of the places that I went. I knew, at least at some part of my trip, I knew someone who could host me. Yeah, if you don't do couch surfing, then visit places from people that you know that are living that. And for me, on the, um, when I arrived in Italy, we had the on-arrival training and I met a lot of other volunteers in Italy that I visited during my volunteering. It, it allowed me to stay at their places, get to know the city that they were living in, in another place perspective that I wouldn't if I was staying just at a hostel or Airbnb. And of course, it also allows you to grow your friendship and it is good to save money as well. Yeah, it sounds actually super nice when you know already that person. Yeah. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about each hiking. How many times did you do it and how far did you go while each hiking? Mm. Okay, how many times? Five. I would say five. H how far did I go? What was the furthest? Or what, what countries did you actually do it? Okay, so I did it in uh, my host country in Bulgaria. When I was doing in, when I was hitchhiking in Bulgaria, I was with my friends. So it was the most fun. <laughs> it's always like that. Yes. We were going to uh, to the Black Sea. So in Bulgaria, in Greece, if any girls who are uh, planning to hitchhike alone in Greece are listening to this, I don't recommend it because it's uh, not safe at all in Greece. My personal experience. Uh, then uh, Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, Serbia and uh, Montenegro. And Montenegro is my favorite country. <laughs> Why is Montenegro your favorite country? Was it because of your hitchhiking experience or the country in general or what you lived there? Any special things? I met my soulmate in Montenegro. <laughs> okay, tell us more about that. Okay, but <laughs> wait. Uh, Montenegro is the most beautiful place I have been to. It has uh, incredibly beautiful mountains, yeah. incredibly beautiful sea and people. They are really tall. <laughs> I was thinking I don't have that uh, preconception about uh, Montenegrins or maybe people don't have. But um, now that I'm thinking about the time that I was in Montenegro, yeah, the people that I met, they were actually tall. 
Yeah, and they are beautiful there. But tell me, tell me about the countries that you visited. Um, so going back to how many how many times I hitched, like during the volunteering it was four, um, and it was mostly in Italy and once in Croatia. So not so many different places. But the funny thing about this is that when I told people in Italy that I had hitchhiked, people would always be shocked because. Like Italy is such not a country where it's it's not usual to each hike in Italy and like no one gives you a ride. And I'm like, well, I managed to do it. It wasn't always easy or immediate that you get the ride. But I think that's part of the each hiking experience, because if you expect that you put put up your thumb and wait for the next car to pass and stop, then you're you're thinking about it wrong. I mean, people may be nice but they're not taxis and they won't stop immediately. So you need to have patience. And that's one thing that I learned about hitchhiking was to have patience and not give up. Um, The first time that I hitchhiked was actually the craziest uh, experience was in Naples. Well, not really in the city, in the Costiera Amalfitana, the Amalfi Coast, which is very touristic and transportation doesn't work so good or... Even if there is transportation, there are too many people, so you can't really use them. Or we couldn't the, that day. So me and a friend of mine, we wanted to go to a sort of like a village. And it was like one hour walking, but it was going up. And actually, we were traveling with our luggage. <laughs> so we were like, okay, we have been waiting for the bus. The bus doesn't come. If it comes, it's full, so we can't enter. So what should we do? And we just, well, let's each hike. Why not? And... We spent like half an hour waiting for someone. Um, And eventually the car that stopped was the fanciest car that had passed by us. A black Mercedes and really nice. And we were like, okay. The guy asked us, where are you going? We said, well, we're going to Ravello. Can you take us there? And he was like, oh, yes, yes, I I can uh, drop you there. He opened the, the trunk and I was very, for the first time hitchhiking, I was like, oh, I don't want to put my luggage in the trunk because, well, maybe what what if... He drops us and then he goes with our luggage. Uh, but eventually, well, it's about trust. So I trusted him and I, we put our bags there. And when we entered, the guy was a private taxi driver. Very shady in that scenario because there was no taxi signs. He was wearing lots of gold. He had a weird name that sounded fake. And I would say that his business was related to the mafia somehow okay so did you enter the car or not well we only noticed this once we were in the car because and this was like through the trip he was telling us some details about his life and we were noticing some things about his like really expensive gold watch all his uh, gold chains this incredible car and going up the mountain he was saying hello to everyone on the street and we're like who the hell is this guy how does he know everyone (laughs) but the the weirdest part of all this wasn't any of this because the guy was extremely nice and interested in us and knowing like more about us why we were there because i was portuguese my friend was albanian and he was actually french living in italy for like 30 years. So he was curious about us, not in a bad way. But the weird thing happened when we arrived at our town and he left us like on the outside of the town. And like there were three guys outside like the parking area that started talking to him. Who are these people? Are they your clients? And basically the guy protected us and said, no, they are my friends. Don't hurt them. And we were like, what the hell just happened? Let's run. (laughs) Uh, but he was like extremely nice he took us to where we wanted to go uh, and he kind of well probably saved us from being robbed so i think that's a positive uh, experience overall (laughs) right right it's a lucky story yes but the thing is when you hitchhike, you never know what you're going to get. You just need to be open to anything and just believe that everything will go out in the right way. <laughs> right, yeah. Hitchhiking is always all about the trust yeah. from both sides. But what about you? Do you have any uh, story 
uh, that uh, you would like to share? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of stories. Mm, okay. One of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites, but the, probably this is one of my favorites uh, that I was in Greece. I was um, staying there for a few days at my friend's house and uh, I was leaving and um, I was on the border of the town. Um, I was staying and uh, there were very few cars passing by and I was, I just couldn't get anyone. So uh, there was a guy on a um, motorbike. He was at first, at first just looking at me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm just hitchhiking, whatever. And then when he saw that nobody is taking me, he took his bike over to me. Mm -hmm. He said that he's going to the place that is written on my sign. Okay. He was barely speaking in English. But uh, the crazy part from my side was that, uh, I mean, it was really, really hot. It was the middle of uh, July. And I was uh, wearing just a top and shirts. And you shouldn't wear clothes like that when you're hitchhiking. It was, <laughs> it was my lesson back then. So I was like, okay, I'm only in sh shorts and I'm getting on the motorbike. Well, okay, I need to get further somehow. So I said, okay, he gave me his helmet and we were on our way. But then I got a bit cold because, you know, it's a motorbike. Yeah. My knees were getting cold and I was like, okay, I don't want to get sick like this. And uh, I asked him to stop and he stopped like in the middle of nowhere. And I said to him, thank you, <laughs> I'm going to take another car. But there were no cars at all. What? So I just, uh, there was like a field and there was one car just staying there. And uh, then I saw that there are like few people walking around. There was like a fireplace or something like that. And uh I heard that they are speaking in a language that I know, which is not Greek. And I was looking at them and I was like, oh my God, it's Russian. And, and then um, the guy uh, with the motorbike, he was not going anywhere. He was just standing there. And those people who were uh, near the car, they noticed me finally. And then they saw that I have a sign. And... Um, they started speaking with me. They were like old grandpas. And at first they were trying to speak uh, in Greek with me. I was at first trying to speak with them in English and they were like, uh, no. And then I asked them, do you speak in Russian? And they were like, of course we do. And we started to speak in Russian and I was telling them that I'm going to this place. And I was with this guy on the motorbike, but I don't want to go with him anymore. And then that guy was starting to speak with them. And in that moment, I didn't understand what is happening. Uh, but once I got in the car with those grandpas, they told me that uh, the guy was saying uh, to them that the girl is with him. And uh, they were saying, no, she's going to do whatever she wants. And she doesn't want to go with you. She's coming with us. And basically, they saved my <laughs> life. And uh, yes, uh, like the next 40 minutes in the in the car with those grandpas was like uh, from a comedian co movie because they were super funny. They were treating me like uh, their granddaughter. And uh, yes, I was safe and sound. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was really nice. Yes. So, yes, my my takeaway from your story is you should also be uh, careful in who you accept uh, a ride from. Always. But trust is also part of the equation. Um, to round this up, I would like to ask you what did these trips actually help you with in terms of uh, like getting to know the region better, the country better, and how did they improve your experience in the vo during the volunteering? Well, I would actually like to switch this question <laughs> in a way. Okay. Yes, I got to know the countries better. I, I really loved uh, all of the experiences I, I had during hitchhiking, during, during traveling, 
But uh, for me, like the biggest breaking point was uh, my trip alone. Uh, the big trip, 13 days. I was all by myself. Self, and um, a lot of people didn't understand why I'm uh, on the road alone with anyone by my side. And uh, some people were really worried about me. Some people wanted to take advantage of me. But uh, what I got out of this is, as you said before, trust. Trust the situation. Trust yourself. And uh, it actually made me feel so much more confident in everything that I do. Because if you can survive in Balkans all alone, you can do anything. <laughs> yes, let's hope. Um, uh, I agree. I think that, um, well, not only traveling on your own, I, it has a lot of good things to it. But for me, traveling, particularly in Italy, was incredible because you get to experience so much more. And like for me, when I came back from my, these trips, I would be so much more energetic and willing to do my work as a volunteer. And also, I was always expecting the next trip to happen but that's it was like a, a weird state where you're happy from the past trip and you're working hard and you're you you desire the next one but it doesn't feel like the work that you're doing is bad and for me that was one thing that traveling helped me uh, during the volunteering was like to feel part of the country to get to know like the things around and I think traveling teaches a lot about life and about a country and the people that live there. Uh, for me, maybe it's for you also to understand the community better. So much, so much, I could understand people in Bulgaria so much better when I was uh, getting in uh, Bulgarian cars. Oh yes, if you are listening to ourselves in your couch, please stand up, go somewhere and uh, enjoy yourself and uh, the travel.